we're back again. Hello, everyone. Steve Marinucci, Beatles Examiner, columnist on examiner.com, with yet another episode of Things We Said Today, where we talk about the latest Beatle news um, all over the country and all around the world. And um, with me across the universe, actually across the continent, is uh, my partner in, in crime and partner in, I don't know, um, Mr. Ken Michaels. Hello, Ken. Hi, Steve. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Yeah, we're, 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 we're winging it again today. Uh, what can I say? Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, the big news um, this week, uh, actually Monday, that, and, and it wasn't actually totally unknown because it, it had been leaked out by Variety you know, a few months ago. But uh, the release of the Beatles uh, mono vinyl box set, which is coming uh, September 9th. Gee, I wonder why they picked that day. And, you know, the the significance, I mean, it. number one, it's not surprising. It's not the bone crusher that the original mono CD set was because the mono stuff's been out there. But the the big difference here is something that they didn't do with the stereo set and they're not doing this they're not doing any of the transfers digitally everything is analog and that's mm. a big big difference between the stereo vinyl box set which got a lot of complaints and this one and uh, I, I saw some reaction online uh, first of all a lot of people couldn't believe they were going analog and second when they found out it was true there was a lot of wow, that's fantastic, big surprise. So, Ken, would would what was your reaction about about this whole thing? Well, I knew about the the um, mono vinyl coming out. I just didn't know about how they were going to what the source was going to be, and that was a nice surprise to me. I mean, I am not the biggest mono fan there is. I think that it's an, a very important part, extremely important part of Beatle history. Because that's the way the Beatles heard the music. The Beatles, George Martin and the engineers spent a lot of time on the mono mixes. And very often it's said that they kind of slapped the stereo mixes together very quickly after the mono. For most people, uh, they're used to the stereo mixes. So um, on the one hand, I embrace what's being done right now. I think it's something that should be done because of its, of its historical importance. Obviously, and there are times when I will listen to the mono mixes. Most of the time, I still listen to stereo. There are times on certain recordings and certain albums where I prefer the mono. But I think just because of its historical significance, I, I like the fact that they're doing this on vinyl, and even more importantly, that they're going to the analog tapes to do this and to use the actual markings of how the engineers mixed uh, the music in those days. Mm -hmm. So that one, really one impresses me. One thing that's di that's different here that they did not do with the mono CDs is they're releasing the album separately. And we th the only thing we don't know, and I'm trying to find this out, is whether the mono set's going to come to iTunes. Which, you know, with the, with the fact that they're transferring to digital, I mean, uh, to analog tapes, would make that kind of, you know, kind of silly. But still, I think there were a lot of people that would like to have those mono tracks on um, on iTunes available for download, and so we'll see what happens. I um, I you know I don't know. Um, it, I guess it does kind of sound silly when you think about it, but still, I would I think a lot of people would buy them in the with the Apple lossless format. Would you Would you object to that? Not really. I mean, it it, it does kind of make the point a little bit moot to do that right it's it's um it's important to be able to do that to make the music more accessible but the thing that there's so many things to think about here with this release one is just the fact of the demand of number one vinyl number two mono now how many people are actually going to care about the mono mixes outside of the people who understand the history of it and who grew up on it and how many young people of today actually take the time to really listen, say, with their headphones, to the detail of each individual recording of the Beatles? I don't know if that is the case with young people today. 
I'm just grateful when young people discover that music, but are they going to pay that much attention to the differences between the mono and the stereo? I think this mainly appeals to the first generation fans that grew up on this music who were exposed to the mono mixes early on and the ones who do care about having every variation of every mix that's been released. So you have that issue, plus you have just the whole vinyl issue. And for the longest time, I've heard, oh, vinyl's made a big comeback. I don't really know. I don't really study that all that much. I know that there must be some demand for it because in the Beatle world, it's not just this. But if you notice, every McCartney remaster is available on vinyl. And this is 180 gram vinyl. He always makes sure that all of his remasters are available that way too. Well, so the Beatles, the Beatles aren't the only one doing it. I mean, everybody's putting out vinyl now. Okay. Which, I mean, it, it, that that's I think the bigger issue is that that not only are the Beatles doing it, but everybody else is doing it too. And and you mean I mean, every vinyl, every new release that's out there from new artists are also available on vinyl. No, not every new release, but I mean there are a lot of them. A lot of, especially the big ones, you know, Dylan, Springsteen, all those. I mean, all those things are coming out. The vinyl section is getting bigger than it was. Okay. Um, I mean the the new vinyl section. I mean, my local record store still has old vinyl for you know real cheap, but but the new vinyl. Um, and the you know the well done vinyl is still available. Mm-hmm. Um, so I mean this is this is interesting that they're going to this trouble and and they're going to especially the analog part of it. That's really kind of that's really kind of cool that they're doing that. That's so, the most interesting aspect of it all. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and like I said, there were a lot of objections to the to the stereo set. For that reason, and um, so it's interesting that they have gone to that. They're not using the 2009 re- remasters. You know, that's saying something there that they're doing that, and and I'm I'm glad uh, I'm glad they're you know I'm glad they they heard that, especially for something like mono that everybody really cares about. Um, so it's going to be interesting to hear, you know, how good this sounds. So, right. Do you um, do you listen to music on vinyl at all these days, Steve? No, not really. I, I wish I could say I did. I don't. I basically listen to. Well, I, I mean, I do. I do listen to CDs. So, no, I don't. I haven't listened to, to vinyl in a long time, uh, unfortunately. I wish I did hear more of it. I have heard a little, but not not a lot. Hmm. Um, but there, I mean. Vinyl has has its fans, and for good reason. There's a lot. There's a there's a different texture, I think you could say. With oh, as, as they've always said that um, analog is a much warmer sound, and I agree. And and mono is a much warmer sound. Mono, uh, especially the, you know the the Beatle albums in mono, you know they take a little bit of I wouldn't say adjustment, but I mean there's a little bit of, I mean you hear the difference right away. But it's, it is it's it they're warmer anyway. Mon, I think the, the monos are, you know. I, I think I mentioned this before that my for, uh, my original Beatle albums from way back were all mono, and in fact I, I didn't hear Sgt. Pepper until years out years and years after in pe- in stereo. Mm-hmm. And um, although you know, and, and going back and listening to the the mono CD was was like. You know, it was like a revelation again because it, I'd miss. There's so much that you miss, and you know, with the white album, there were great differences. But um, yeah, I mean, this is this is really good, and I'm glad they're doing it. If there's one thing that that you could say might be a problem here is the fact that the initial price tags for the set are really high. Um, Amazon's initial um, price tag on this set is f- over four hundred dollars, which is pretty pretty nasty. Um, somebody clued me in that uh, Amazon Canada is cheaper by about fifty dollars, hmm. but that's still pretty high. And there's no there's no doubt that the price will come down later. Yeah, always wait. Yeah, you know, unless but you really have to have it now. Unless you really have to have it now, right? But yeah, initially the the prices are are pretty high. In fact, I did check last night 
just for the heck of it, to see how the Japanese price is. And in American dollars, that comes out to over 600 bucks. Wow. Yeah. That's that's a bit uh, a bit high. Yeah. And I you know, and uh the press release said they're making this in Germany and I don't know if that means the Japanese sets the Japanese sets usually aren't done are done in Japan because they have the you know the uh, Japanese extras the lyric books and stuff. So and I don't know what the Japanese is going to have but I'm assuming and like I said that's just an assumption that you know, the Japanese is going to have something extra too, but still, six hundred bucks—that's quite a bit. Mm. But well, I'm just very impressed about this whole thing that they're doing. This, I mean, mm-hmm. in my personal opinion, and I could be wrong. I w- I just think of the fact that that it is mono. There wouldn't be as much of a demand as the stereo, right or wrong. The fact that it's vinyl, it doesn't seem to matter that the demand may not be as great. EMI is just addressing this and saying there's a need for this. So just the fact that they're doing that, that alone is a celebration to me. Right. You can argue back and forth, and it's a great debate what's, you know, what are better, the stereo or the, or the mono mixes. And, you know, it makes for fascinating conversation. I don't think that there's an across-the-board, you know, one or the other. There are certain albums that you may prefer more in mono than in stereo, certain songs in particular. I'm very much one of those people that... When it comes to lead vocals, I don't like hearing lead vocals in one channel. And that always bothers me, especially if you're somewhere where your speakers are far apart from each other. Certain songs, especially ones that Paul sang, like Sgt. Pepper, like Michelle, I don't like those kind of mixes. At the same time, you know, I find it fascinating why certain songs were mixed a certain way where there were drastic differences, especially in uh, speed differences, like in She's Leaving Home or Helter Skelter and uh, discovering why they were mixed that way. So um, it's always an interesting debate between the stereo and the mono, but the mere fact that, you know, that they're doing this, that they're saying that this is an important part of their history. And I always remember hearing that back in the 70s, John was at a party in, I think, Los Angeles, and somebody played Sgt. Pepper at the party, and it was the stereo mix, and he looked confused. He said, what is this? I don't remember this because that's not the way that he remembered hearing it. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there are, there'll always be fans out there who will think, we should be hearing the music the way they heard it, the way that they approved it. And then, yeah. they'll, then there'll be the others who will say, yeah, but I was brought up a certain way, like on the American albums and all, and you're used to hearing the songs with those mixes and the reverb that was added here in America and that kind of thing. I'm just thought that's just going into that other direction with the American releases. Right. But, you know, a lot is just, it, it has to do with the way that you're brought up and whether or not you really care all that much about all the different variances. Right. There are fans out there that just love the music because they're great songs and they're great recordings and may not get into what some people might consider to be kind of trivial. You know, mm-hmm. as far as the differences in, in the songs. Well, in in my case, I mean, I I think the mono um, the mono uh, stuff is better for listening in a home environment. I know from years of listening to Beatles in the in the car, commuting, for example. Um, I like to have the stereo in the car. For some reason, it just it just just does something. I don't know in the car to have it in stereo, the impact is, is nicer. Hmm. But, you know, you, could, you can go either way. Um, the mono does have, ha, you know, it does have its qualities and the stereo does have its qualities. The interesting thing, if you recall, was when we talked to Billy J. Kramer and we talked to Peter Asher, both of them said that they that they also preferred the mono versions of their songs. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm sure that if you asked practically any British invasion artist, you know, that's the same, you know, it's going to be the same thing. They all preferred the, the mono over the stereo. So, I'm, you know, I'm glad for the, you know, that they are bringing this back. And it's really a, they've, and they've done, they put some care into this one. You know, this is really a, um, a nice, they've really done a nice version, a nice project of this. And uh, it also comes with a book like the stereo vinyl does. And uh, if 
the book with the mono is anything like the stereo, it's going to be a really nice, nice book. That was a nice addition to that uh, set. Hmm. And in uh, an article that you wrote on this, didn't you say that the two guys who were working on this, they were also involved with other Beatle projects? Mm-hmm. Yeah. They they both have uh, Sean McGee and I can't remember the other guy's name. Steve Berkowitz. Um, hmm? Steve Berkowitz. Berkowitz, right. Yeah, they both have, not only have they worked on Beatle projects, but they've worked on other things, too, So, uh, for other artists. So they've, they, they're two experienced guys. They both have Grammys. Or the, yeah, they both won Grammys. They're going to, you know, this will be this will be uh, very interesting. No, it just seems like something that's being tastefully done. Yep. yep. So and, I'm all uh, for it. You know. Yeah. So, and um, they're using the same procedures as as they used in the '60s. So they're they're doing it. It's it's going to be really uh, really a nice little project. A really nice little release. So that's a good thing. Okay. And we should also point out that as we're taping the show, it's on June the 18th. And it's not every day that we record a show on a Beatle birthday. That's true. So today, Paul McCartney turns 72. And uh, happy birthday to Paul. We send, I don't think uh, he wants us to sing. I don't think, they, I don't think the listeners want us to sing either. Well, they're very smart, our listeners. They're very smart, that's true. But um, we thought we would do a quick little kind of a list of our three favorite romantic McCartney songs, both from Beatle days and from solo days. You want to yeah, you, you can say love songs. Love songs? That's, as they're generally known. <laughs> as they're generally known. Okay. I'll, you go You go first. We'll, we'll, let's just alternate. Oh, okay. Um, I'd probably have to pick... Oh, there's so many good ones here. I'm going to pick number one, Only Love Remains. I just think that's one of the most underrated songs in Paul's career, in his solo catalog. It's okay. a song of perfection. It's a beautiful melody. The lyrics are wonderful. The way he sings it is perfect. The arrangement is just so nice. And I like the, the album version of that song more than the single version with the saxophone solo. Yeah, that's just a beautiful love song. There's no doubt about it. And I kind of wish that that would be considered a standard at this point. Because it really deserves to be. Okay. But it was also coming at a time when Paul was gradually receiving less airplay and his chance of getting a big hit was was getting slimmer and slimmer. But, um, yeah, I would definitely put that one way up there. And I, I like to give attention to the songs that weren't the big hits, although sometimes you just have to acknowledge them, too. You want to go back and forth, or you want me to just name my other let's two? Go back, let's go back and forth. Uh, my okay. first... My first mention will be uh, Here, There, and Everywhere. Okay. I love the melody. Um, the melody of that is one of the better Lennon-McCartney melodies, uh, and I don't think it gets enough credit. But it's just a great, it's just a great song. There's so, you know, there's so many. We could sit here and go, you know, run off Lennon-McCartney love or McCartney love songs all day long. There's just so so many great ones, but that particular one just kind of stuck in my head. Um, also, it's one that Paul cites as being his favorite. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so. it's, just, it's just a beautiful, just a beautiful song. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I'm going to put the long and winding road in there okay. because I think it's that's another one that, um, again, gorgeous melody. I like the arrangement. It's one of those songs that, as far as I'm concerned, despite the fact that I know a lot of people are going to disagree with this, you can't destroy it. Whether Phil Spector produced it or whether it's just bare bones Paul on the piano, it's just so beautiful in every single way. I love the sentiment in that song, the lyrics. It's very poetic. And Paul's voice, uh, especially on, on the Beatle recording of it. I like all the different versions that he's done live of it. I like the Wings Over America version with the brass arrangement there. I like the version that came from the Flowers and the Dirt Sessions. Um, it's one that really stands out for me. And, you know, it's really apples and oranges here. I mean, I could just as easily say here, there, and everywhere, but I really love The Long and Winding Road. It's one that, um, over the years, I think I've appreciated so much more than when it first came out. I always loved the song, but now I love it so much more. Did you see the letter the Paul McCartney letter to Alan Klein, right? Mm -hmm. That that showed up on Facebook yesterday. Um, 
I, it was really kind of, I, I don't know if I'd seen that before or not. I, I'm sure I have, but it did ring a lot of bells. Uh, I mean, it, it, it did kind of flash back a little bit to the whole situation with Long and Winding Road. I'm going to read just a little bit of it here. It says, Dear Sir, and this is written to Alan Klein, in future, no one will be allowed to add or to or subtract from a recording of one of my songs without my permission, mm-hmm. <laughs> which is really, really interesting. And I'm not going to read the whole letter, but the last, his last, before Paul signs, he puts down four points um, about the specifications uh, that he wanted done. And the last thing is, don't ever do it again, sign Paul McCartney. <laughs> And like, and he sent copies to Spectre and to John Eastman, which I think is interesting. But it was dated April fourteenth, nineteen seventy. So, yeah, that song is is um, is one for great discussion amongst Beatle fans and how they feel about it. Because I know mm-hmm. some that don't care for the song. I know some people who will say that the song needed Phil Spector's production for it to be the big hit that it was. You know, I don't know. I I've always seen it. Uh, I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd heard the um, the get back, uh, the original get back version, and and really liked that. So I don't necessarily think it necessarily needed it. Probably if it if you were going to put strings and and all that stuff on it, it could have been done a little more tastefully. I think Spectre maybe overdid it a little bit, but that's neither here nor there. I don't know. I'm very used to it. I know Paul really didn't want the harp in there. Right, and he in fact he says. In the letter, it says, harp to be removed completely at the end of the song and original piano notes to be substituted. Hmm. So that was quite interesting. Anyway, my second song would be Maybe I'm Amazed. Okay. I think the lyrics to that song are some of Paul's best ever lyrics. There has never been... I think if I had to pick top five lyrics of all the songs Paul has written, that has to be one of the top five. I just love... The off-handed, the understated way he he put the lyrics in there, uh, I think that's just beautiful. Yeah, so, well, you're going to find a lot of people agreeing with you, right? And I also like the way the the piano builds and 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 uh, the way he did that. So that would be that would be uh, number two. And by the way, these are not necessarily in order of liking, but I just have to mention that one. So. Hmm. Okay. And uh, it's worth pointing out, every now and then I will find a, a survey of some kind that rates uh, Beatles and solo songs and all, and, and more often than not, that song rates as the best of Paul's solo songs. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, certainly worthy of it. There's so much power and emotion in that song. And, the, and right. like you said, the buildup, especially on Paul's vocals on the, the, um, the studio version. And I love the live version, too. So... I tend yeah, to. I, I I can't remember for sure if he's played it when I've seen him, but I think he did actually when I saw him at least once. I think he played it, and, and uh, I just that absolutely would have would have made my night because I love that the way he does that. He never does that badly. Hmm. Do you like the studio or the live version better? Well, I've I, I mean I've always been in love with the studio version since I first heard it. You know, it, it's six of one, half a dozen of the other because he really doesn't vary the arrangement on the live version when he does it because of the way it is. I mean, there's really not much way way to go. You're, he's pretty limited with that song to where he's going to take it. Hmm. So at least that's the way I'm thinking. I, I don't, he's never really, you know, really over orchestrated it or really changed it from the studio version. I don't recall, I'm trying to look, trying to think off the top of my head. I don't recall that we've ever heard any outtakes of that. That would be interesting. That would be very interesting. Okay. Um, okay. And I'm going to go with Through Our Love, which is from really, Pipes you of went, Peace. You went very deep into the catalog, very deep. Well, you know, I tend to cling on to songs that are not recognized by the artist, that I, I think deserve I to you be. You know, it's not that I'm a, not acknowledging the classics. You know, I definitely would put Here, There, and Everywhere way up the chain, especially Paul himself has cited that song as being you know, his favorite. And he, he likes how complete Here, There, and Everywhere is from start to finish. And that little introduction that he had in the very beginning of the song, which when when um, Kisses on the Bottom came out, he was pointing out how that was influenced by the standards 
you know, of uh, the 30s and 40s that had introductions that were separate from the body of the song. Right. Which the Beatles also used in Do You Want to Know a Secret, too. Yeah. But, um, yeah, Here, There, and Everywhere is way up there. But Through Our Love is just a great song, too. It's a song that's just so positive, you know. We can go through our love. We can do things that they said were impossible. I love that whole sentiment right there. I think the melody is great. I think the arrangement is great. It's Paul working with George Martin again. And it's it's one of the many love songs that was never released as a single or wasn't a hit that I think deserves to be recognized way up there. And and My Love is way up there, too, as far as a song that was a huge hit that, that uh, is a great love song. Mm-hmm. But um, I tend to go with that one and Only Love Remains as amongst, you know, the greatest of all time from Paul. And I kind of wish that they would be uh, given the same credit as the more well-known songs, because they really deserve to be. Okay. Well... I'm tempted to I'm tempted to go with the real obvious, which uh, you can probably guess what the real obvious is. Yesterday, but, yeah, but <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna actually not do that, and I'm gonna mention I saw her standing there. That's not a love song. Well, sure it is. It's a love song only in the sense of the lyrics, but it's a there rocker. We there we go. She was just seventeen. You know what I mean. Nobody would Wait. classify that as, as a love song. That's a sure rock it song. It's a rocker. It's a love it's also a love song. That those lyrics those lyrics are are, are love are love lyrics. They're very romantic. You can say I I didn't did I did I so get you're... on your case about the songs you <laughs> the songs you picked? No, but okay. you know, most people when they think of love songs they think of ballads. They think yeah. of ballads. Well I'm I'm being different. That's okay. That, you know, I'm I'm being Mr. Individual. So there. <laughs> are you being that way just so that you can be individual, or are you doing that because you really feel that way? Well, uh, no, I, I I do really think that song is. You know, I I've always liked the the spark in that in that lyric, and it would be too, it really would be very easy to pick yesterday. I mean, I sat here. You know, as I we were doing this, and I'm going, well, should I pick yesterday? You know, ever you know, yesterday is so obvious, and I decided that yesterday was a little too obvious. I mean, there's no, there's no, you know, there's no uh, way you can say that yesterday is not a great romantic song, and in fact, it's probably you know one of the, it's probably it's one of the biggest romantic songs in the history of music, and so, but I can't, but. I, I was trying to be just a little different and just be a little surprising, and that's why I picked that. So I, I don't have a problem with that. Okay. So well. there. <laughs> you don't like it? I, Too bad. All right. You rebel, you. Yes. Anyway. I guess we should just wrap things up then. I guess we should. So we if should. anyone would, would like to get in touch with us, they can write to us at our email address, which is things we said today radio show at gmail dot com. If people want to get in touch with you, Steve, all they have to do is they can go to my Facebook page, uh, my my name Facebook page, and uh, I'm there all the time, probably too much. And you can also email me at beetlesexaminer at gmail dot com, and I'll be more than happy to to talk to you and reply to you and. You know, you can yell at me and scream at me. I know people have, I've gotten a few comments about what I've, a couple of things I've said on the show, and you can write to me and and uh, and say whatever you like about what I what I've said here or what I said what I write about, um, and I'll be you know glad to respond. And if you'd like to write to me, my email address is everylittlething at att dot net, and by all means, if you want to just say how relatively safe um, Steve's list was while mine is far more adventurous by all means I welcome your comments oh boy I'm willing to listen to anything <laughs> that our listeners have to say but uh, yes uh, please write to me at every little thing at att.net and also um, I do have a Facebook page at Ken Michaels we have a Facebook page at things we said today we and also I also have a, gr- a Facebook group yeah. If you want to say how 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 way too deep Ken went with his song, oh, please, you're welcome to do that. We need we need to have an on air fight. 
I don't I don't think that we're we're tough enough to do that. No, I don't think so either. I don't think so either. We uh, need someone to light a fire underneath us. No, Jim Morrison is no longer with us. <laughs> well, we'll anyway. find someone. Anyway, well, um and I also have my own website which is kenmichaelsradio.com with Beatles trivia every single week, prizes to give away, interviews galore. Uh, new interviews with uh, Lawrence Juber and Steve Holly, and uh, that's at KenMichaelsRadio.com. So please check it out. There we go. And so this is uh, this is that's it for another week uh, uh, on things we said today. This is Steve Marinucci, Beatles Examiner columnist, saying we will see you next time. And this is Ken Michaels thanking all of you for listening, and we'll see you next time. <laughs> 